But on the other hand, we saw just the birth of what I call recursive fitness movement. I get fit so I can get fit. So I can be better at the gym, so I can spend more time in the gym, so that I can spend more time in the gym. <laughs> and the original mission of the gym was yeah. to train for something. Train. this off today we're in uh in tj's gym i think that's that's where we are yeah, right ne- now next door to our little filming studio right and uh you know it's a pretty cool area it's uh, a little bit different but quiet which is nice and uh we stayed at i would say it's kind of like the cartels like <laughs> headquarters within uh san francisco kind of area that's how it felt that's where we stayed oh, you guys night. Were in, oh in the city last night Sort of. Sort of. We're like about 30 minutes from here. Yeah. I don't know. It all looks like the same to me. But uh, <laughs> They said it was three stars, but I feel like it was three-star cocaine they were selling. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little it's bit good, different. You, good, you had a good little urban experience. Yeah. 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 That's, that's all part of traveling, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, you have no idea where to go. <laughs> that's right. We've, we've had some experiences. But um, look, there was obviously a lot of places we could have taken this, the start of this podcast, but we had a discussion about it. And, and where I wanted to get started was... If you ever felt like during the, the whole journey from when you, say, put out your first video when you started that 365 days, kind of way back then to the point where you are now, was there ever a point where, you know, these people started showing up with these injuries or with these restrictions and they wanted to get better at being in the gym, right? All of a sudden, the needs of what someone wanted to do in the gym was way different to what it used to be. Before, you just had to sit on a machine and just do this or you had to do it a Jane Fonda class or whatever, but now people are like, hey, I've I got to fix my rack position or you know, I've got to squat deeper, I need to get my knees out, whatever it might be. And then as soon as you turned on the tap of popularity, obviously, you just got more and more of the same thing. Was there ever a point where you started to think to yourself, why, am, like, is it this problem that keeps showing up that I don't necessarily need to solve anymore because it's not really for the right reasons? Like, you would almost say to that person, okay, but why do you really need to do that wouldn't it just be easier if you know you didn't focus so much time and energy on that and instead you maybe put more time into your nutrition or maybe into other areas of your life like your family or whatever it is we just kind of created this overly elite need to move in a certain way and I think maybe we we drew way too far on the other end of the spectrum and almost to a point where you know we saw in our gym people started coming in with the same injuries and we're like okay but why why do you have to do such heavy deadlifts for so many bouncing reps why do you have to do so many kipping pull-ups you know did you ever think to yourself at a certain point i'm never going to win this battle and maybe i need to go somewhere else or maybe i need to look somewhere else there's a lot so i clearly see how you feel about this <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> i think it's obvious so uh first of all that as we unpack that um I think it's, a, it's vital to recognize that for the first time, a lot of people were Olympic lifting and exposed to kettlebells and some of the basics of gymnastics, right? Mm-hmm. People couldn't heel strike anymore because you, you can't. You can't keep up. You can't run on a true form and heel strike. So it, these things ought to correct. So for the first time, I think, ever, people had a formal movement language, and that language was classic strength and conditioning, and it was a brutal mistress because what we found out is that, yes, I could work really hard, right? I could make my transitions better. I could put, I could optimize my eating, but if I didn't have access to my positions and shapes, man, I got crushed. Mm. You know, like you just can't overhead squat. Do you remember there's an old video for the crossfitters out there where Nicole Carroll is overhead squatting against a, a guy at a, at a seminar somewhere. I think it's Orange County uh, I, I, or maybe that was in Arizona. And so they're overhead squatting 95 pounds and this guy does like six reps and just falls apart. And he's jacked. You well, see? he's jacked up. That's for sure. <laughs> And Nicole is just straight up and down. And her technique isn't great, but right. it's efficient enough. And what that really started to show me was, hey, why aren't we talking about efficiency? Why aren't we talking about coordination? <clears throat> and as you have to parse out the fact that when we all got into this modern, because this is really a revolution in the last 15 years. Right. And, you know, I think it's people walking down there like, oh, you know, I've been doing this forever. I'm like, dude, you couldn't. When we started San Francisco CrossFit, you couldn't buy a kettlebell. In the city, in the entire city. We had to drive to Santa Cruz to buy a kettlebell. So things have changed. Now you can go to Walmart and buy kettlebells, right? You forget those things. Yeah. Yeah. Rogue wasn't a thing. We we bought 
these fishing net rings and made our own rings on cam straps and fishing net rings. Okay. You know, we welded our own racks. I mean, that, that was the, 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 the era. And, and so we have to imagine then is that people weren't exposed to any of this stuff. You know, um, they weren't doing Turkish get-ups. They were, you know, some populations, you know, so if, even if you take the FMS, right, the Functional Movement Screen by Greg Cook, that came out in 96. Can you tell me what, can I see your phone from 1996? <laughs> can I see your tape deck you're listening to? Yeah, yeah. So, Maybe a Spotify so yeah. it was the first time where I think anyone was really legitimately in a strength and conditioning community that required full range of motion. And I can see how initially, you know, Greg Glassman's vision was he's like, dude, people can't deadlift, they can't run, they're not fit, they can't even do like sets of 10 pull-ups. Like, what are we even talking about, right? Like, mm. let's make the basics. We are way past that now, right? The, the, the fitness world is crazy. You know, <clears throat> um, you know, Mike, check this out. There was an article in uh, one of the early journals about a guy getting rhabdo from doing 100 kettlebell swings. Okay. In the CrossFit Journal? Yep. Yeah, just yeah. about talking about early rhabdo. Guy did 100 kettlebell swings, got sick. 100 swings. Like, my daughter, who's 10, does 100 swings so she can have a popsicle and watch her favorite television show. <laughs> I mean, that's honestly yeah. what's yeah. happening now. And she swings the 35. She swings the woman's weight. And she's 10. So the whole Jeez. world is upside down, <laughs> right? And, you know, it's 50, it's 50 uh, swings for one popsicle, you know, and she'd be like, can I have two? I'm like, dude, you know what the price is? And she's like, no problem. <laughs> so, <clears throat> no problem. So I'm broken. Uh, <laughs> the, the, first, the first order of business is understanding, well, we had to catch everyone up to be able to play this game, and that game was modern strength and conditioning. And if you came out of a tradition of gymnastics or you came out of a tradition of Olympic lifting, it was better, you had better access to those positions. So my first year of physio school is when I found uh, CrossFit, right? And I really struggled to reconcile what I was learning in physio school with what I was, what I knew as an experience as an athlete on a national team and what, um, what we were actually doing to get people strong. Because what we found out when we first came to the gym was that we weren't strong, we weren't fit, and we weren't skilled. Yeah. All those things were just, you know, like I was already a national champion at something. I was pretty good. Mm. But I sucked at everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and now, so we get in, into this and we're like, this is amazing. I mean, there was a time where, you know, snatching 135 for 30 reps blew our minds. We didn't know if it was possible. Adrian and I, like, had a day. We, we, we strategized. We, had, like, had a special coffee. We, like, made, like, <laughs> we danced, like, the haka. Like, we just got fired up. And we're like, well, however long it takes. You know, I think we yeah. split snatched. Like, we just didn't know it was even possible. And we, split you know, snatch. and <laughs> all, all the techniques, right? And, and now that's like, that's laughable, right? Mm. So I, I think um, it's, it's difficult to keep in context where we've gone. Okay, so yeah. people are coming in and suddenly discovering for the first time because they're a product of a system that ellipticaling and cable crossovers don't, don't expose you. And it turns out that if you can do all the things that a human is supposed to do, is being able to do naturally, indigenously, you're natively, you know, like squatting down and taking a poop, like what the hell? I mean, you can't squat on the ground, keep your heels on the ground. Like that is, what, what happened to you? Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing is, <clears throat> and to, I think where we get into your point is, what we saw was a lot of compensation and that we were taught that all we count, and, and, and this is a product, frankly, of scoring. So the, the idea of writing people's times on the board and writing people's reps on the board and, and competing a little bit was really brilliant because it raised everyone's intensity and it gave us a reason to train and have training partners, right? In a real way. That's why you ride with friends, I mean, on a bike ride. Mm. The problem is you get what you value. So if we value going fast, you're going to go as fast as you can, right? And this is inherently the problem of turning training into a sport. Mm. That's why, you know, lifting stones or something like that, but it makes sense. So show us your strategy to solve a problem, but grading someone's quality of their ring dip as a competition is always going to have a slippery slope aspect because people are going to try to say, well, I did as much work as I needed. So what, what are the, 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 the end points of that? What are the waypoints? And so subsequently, you see people developing a lot of work capacity. And I think initially we were really protected because we were all beginners. No one was really that strong right? Really, no one was strong and no one was that fit. Fast forward a decade, man. I mean, everyone is a mutant. I mean, <laughs> I know how many like recreational CrossFitters would be like, I'd love to go back to the first games. Yeah. I would destroy yeah. everyone. <laughs> you know, like, you know? 
They did two time workouts machine. in one day. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, I think if we could time machine back, you would be blown away yeah. at what was possible. Yeah. You know? So, on the one hand, what we got, there's always going to be a, a – not always, but in this case, I think there was a double-edged sword between, hey, let's work – because we weren't really working hard. We weren't really – exposed to a lot of these movements. We weren't very fluent in these things. And all of a sudden we started compensating to solve a problem. And compensation is, yeah, you know, if we define fitness as just doing work, then who cares? But now what we're realizing is, boy, if you compensate a lot by solving a a motor problem in a novel way, we confuse that tolerance with best practice. So yeah, yeah. You, dude, round your back, overextend. You want to overextend all you want while you snatch and then <clears throat> try to rotate your shoulders while you dip and do all the things that are unskilled and don't lead to better outputs and outcome, then knock yourself out. And it'll work for a while, but eventually you're going to lose, right? This is why Rich Froning and Annie gets better and Frazier is mechanically efficient. And just look at our best athletes as examples of people who are mechanically more and more and more efficient. And what you're seeing is that that language, because it was a new community, it took us a second. That's okay. It's a new phenomenon. You know, we're caught up. So now what we're seeing is, um, you know, if you are starting to accumulate sort of the pain-related things that are typical to a gym environment, you then need to say, okay, this is a normal experience, a normal output of just doing a lot of pull-ups and burpees and conditioning in a crappy shape, but you won, so that's fine. Let's either yeah. own that, or we need to change how we're training what we value, which means, hey, we can be in better shapes. And the point is, and we used to say this, look, Glassman, I taught, I mean, it used to be Greg Glassman did every lecture, and then it was Greg Glassman, Dave Castro, Nicole Carroll, and Kelly Starrett. So, I mean, I have been around for a long time teaching it, right? And I saw Greg say many times, you can handle a post-maximal load in an isometric position safely. You're, it just looks like your back is flat and you're not moving, mm. right? Doesn't ever, he never said, get into the angriest cat you can, you know, <laughs> and get this done. That bounces yeah. as hard as it can. So what you're seeing is, hey, that's an, that's an artifact of, of training. So now add into the fact that in this strength conditioning fitness world, people got really good results fast. And, and I think we're having to untangle that a little bit mouth breathing, yeah. nose breathing, energy. Like, you can't just be a hot sugar burner all the rest of your life. I don't think we know what the prices of that is. But on the other hand, we saw just the birth of what I call recursive fitness movement. I get fit so I can get fit. So I can be better at the gym, so I can spend more time in the gym, so that I can spend more time in the gym. <laughs> and the original mission of the gym was yeah. to train for something. And mm-hmm. gymnastics confuses that because gymnastics happens in the gym. Olympic lifting confuses us because the Olympic lifting happens in a gym and powerlifting confuses us. But the point of not those three sports was to actually train for something. Mm-hmm. So to your point, what are you doing? A long time ago, we weren't fit or strong and we needed to spend some time, but now we're starting to get fit and strong. And I think Marcus Philly, for example, has done a great job of tapping into the ethos of, hey, I want to look great. Mm-hmm. Let's use this as, as bodybuilding right? Mm. And I don't want to use the word vanity because I don't really care why you want to train, but at least you're asking yourself to have full movement expression. Like Marcus moves like a, an automaton. He moves really beautifully, mm. right? And he's got good genetics and he's very handsome and shaved. <laughs> and, but the idea well, is whatever the reasons you want to train, fine, but don't, it's a, it's a really specious argument when you're coming back to say, this is better because I can do more in the gym. And w- I think the error of our ways is that we sometimes have this, realize we have this gorgeous tool called strength conditioning, which is simultaneously a stimulus for adaptation. That's why we train, right? To get better and a diagnostic tool. And your positional quality is very much a moving target based on like, I mean, your output's a moving target, right? How did how you sleep? You guys are sleep deprived. You're sleeping in some cocaine alley you're talking about. <laughs> I guarantee you, if we're going to train today, I'm going to kill you, yeah. right? I've been in my home. <laughs> I've rested. I'm in love with my wife yeah. and my kids are good. And yeah, yeah. like, I'm in my neighborhood, right? Yeah. You guys yeah. are like, where I'm am I? I don't, this coffee sucks. <laughs> yeah. That's right. So what I think what we need to doesn't wreck <laughs> over here. No, it doesn't. Um, it's as good as that coffee can get. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the idea is, wh- you know, what are we training for? And, and that's okay to also shift that conversation because we had to get to a place where we're like, okay, everyone's leveled up now. But it can't just I mean at some point you're strong enough. I mean, that's really unpopular to say. And, you know, um, if you don't like tapping and go, you just do singles. So if it says 10 reps of something, 
You just do 10 singles. Mm. You don't have to get into a shitty position and pull. Mm. And so, uh, you know, again, that's the maturity of what's happening. Um, you know, the, the key here is I think when we try to fit into what this language is, because what I'll tell you is that I, I very much take for granted sometimes that everyone in my community can Olympic lift. Even my kids, my, my mother-in-law muscle snatches, right? Mm. She knows what a muscle snatch is. She's 72, right? She's at our gym. And um, it, this community is, speaks these languages fluently, and I sometimes forget that every other community doesn't, right? It's pretty Im- impressive and Im- incredible. But as we, the other side of that, again, is what are we training for? And I think if you lay out this coursework of what is the most important or why are we training? Well, you can sort of say, okay, we have sports specific training, which is I am training to support one sport. And the only outcome is, am I better at that sport? Did I run faster? And ultimately did I win my sport, right? Am I healthy enough to keep playing my sport? That's sports specific training. Sports specific training is not, let's try to mimic your sport by standing on a BOSU ball because you're a surfer. That's, that's, stupid that's childish right it's about hey what are the demands of your sport and we don't really care if you can develop all these capacities as long as your shapes are good and you're stable and you get better at your sport right you can surf out surf everyone okay so that's sports specific training in the middle of what we have is what we call sports preparation training this is a language i'm trying to develop so sports sports preparation means that I am keeping an eye on energy systems sure I'm also keeping an eye on positions because I'm interested in not just fitnessing did I get fitter by going up and down? Because that's currently how we're defining fitness. As long as I can just do a bunch of work, it's fine. Mm. But that doesn't translate to sports. In fact, it causes problems in sports. It, it creates havoc on stability in swimming. If you're overhead in a crappy position and then I'm asking you to swim or do a complex motor skill, I'm now competing with those complex motor skills. So here's an example. The dumbbell under has ruined jump roping. I, I've never said this out loud. Right, RPM, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Buddy Lee, well, he's got my back. But look at the jumping mechanism, right? We're trying to jump straight up. Yep. We're trying to have this kind of beautiful triple extension, right? That, mm-hmm. uh, you know, even the, in the Chinese lever theory of weightlifting, you know, can we extend straight up? Mm-hmm. Can we squeeze our butt, flex our quads, point the toes, point straight up and manage that? Well, all of a sudden, if the, all the only thing we value is the jump rope going around twice, then however you solve that problem is, yeah. is good for you. And that's, that's not your fault because what we said was to win this game, the jump rope goes around twice. But what I'm saying is to win this game, I want to make sure that you're better at jumping. Mm. And so if your pattern changes, you're jumping straight, and then I'm like jump around twice, and suddenly you start changing, and you do that dolphin <laughs> kick – you know, yeah. fainting goat thing. <laughs> it's bad. Like you're, you're having a seizure. You know what I'm talking yeah, about, yeah. right? The, the dub, and yeah. listen to how people are slamming the ground and how they're stiff. And so what you're actually doing is programming in maybe not an injury mechanism, but you're programming in less efficient movement that doesn't transfer to your Olympic lifting and these other right. things. But you've got the dump, jump rope around. So what I'm asking us to do is, again, put more skill back into this. So in this sports preparation, we're always keeping an eye on does this transfer and does this translate to the things we actually care about, which is complex motor skills. Yeah. And universally, what we figured out, because with the advent of the internet, we suddenly were hanging out and CrossFit. We were hanging out with gymnasts and powerlifters and Olympic lifters and swimmers and bikers. And we could see, I could see the underlying patterns, underlying positions, that the shoulder is the shoulder is the shoulder. That, you know, my, my cue to break the bar or armpit forward or turn the hands out, you, that all suddenly makes sense because everyone has figured out this is a more effective shoulder position. Mm. So that's sports-specific training. On the other side, we have what I think is GPP, which is I'm looking at energy systems, right? And energy system training only really works if you're doing endurance training where there's not a lot of skilled movement. But now we're fitnessing, right? You're being exposed to some of these things, more range of motion. Mm -hmm. And CrossFit can be both. CrossFit could be GPP, and it also can be sports-specific training. So you can take CrossFit and become very sophisticated around it. And I think that the the knock on people who don't understand the potential for the way we train is they only see it as GPP, just just a bunch of dumb work, Mm. right? How fast can we get to 100? Oh, good, you did faster than me. You must be fitter than me. Mm. You know, you won fitness. And on the other side of GPP, we'll call it fitnessing, which is Barry's Boot Camp, Soul Cycle, yeah. like unskilled. Rumble, Rumble theory, let's, just fuck, let's just crush ourselves. I'm yeah. crushed. Yeah. Wasn't that hard? It was hard, right? Yeah. <laughs> so what I, what I think is, is now we need to ask ourselves, what are we applying this fitness towards? And so if you're only interested in just doing a bunch of work, then dude, go GPP yourself. And then when you get hurt, come talk to us and be fine. Mm. If you're interested in 
seeing how all of this applies to more efficient movement patterning, right? Better cutting, jumping, landing. You better be in that sports specific or sports preparation model. It means your foot position cannot be turned out to 30 degrees and kick ass. You cannot do that. If you mm. want a fitness, go knock yourself out. If you want to apply that, that hip extension to any other thing in life, like running or stepping or going up and down stairs, you're going to have to get your feet straight, yeah. which means we're going to have to talk about your ankle range of motion. Yeah. Right? And that's really the, the thing. So to the extent that people care or don't care or they chase – it's not their fault, it's our fault. We have not made the case about what's important and why it's important. Mm. And we haven't valued it long enough. So what we're trying to get people to do is begin to realize that strength and conditioning isn't just about being stronger and fitter. It's also about restitution and restoration of your positional capacity. And that that's a moving target because f jump on an airplane, play in a World Cup match. I'll tell you, you're going to look like crap the next day. Why do we train? To get better, to turn this system back on. So that training environment can have a lot of goals besides yeah. just did I PR on my deadlift today, yes or no. Right? Yeah. That's just an immature child. Do I have a six-pack, yes or no? Like, dude, bro, there's bigger conversations to be yeah. had here. Okay, there's not. <laughs> I'd say what you uh, have a unique skill of is answering all the follow-up questions that pop up mm. in my mind during that conversation, just one after the other. So <laughs> Knock them down. as a result, <laughs> I can move on to the next part. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but we are really at an interesting inflection point, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, Couldn't agree more. And, and there's so much good programming on the internet that, you know... Um, Marcus Philly. It, it, exactly. Yeah. There's a ton of good programming. You can really follow, you know, what people are doing. You know, Carl was so innovative. Carl Powley with his, yeah. with his programming, so innovative. You yeah. know, and um, and now you can have access. And now the problem is, now you're just crushed with choices. You know, is it the Swolger on it? Are you, you know, America, who, yeah. who who do you, he's awesome. Yeah, we had uh, him on. <laughs> he's yeah. awesome. Um, one of our favorite th memes here at the house, at the gym, is we always try to come up with what ours, our go-to Thursday left-handed kettlebell flow is. Like he's oh, always yeah, like, this yeah. is my go-to, and everyone is a go-to, which yeah, is my yeah. favorite. So <laughs> anytime we work out together, we always like chest bump, dan dance back and forth, <laughs> and like knuckle bump. Nice. Um, so you've, like over the, for people who don't know, when you kind of moved out of the CrossFit scene or in the public eye of the CrossFit. Even though I still own the 21st CrossFit. That's, mm -hmm. that's true. You started working with people like across all different domains. Uh, unfortunately, the All Blacks, but we won't get into that. And then other like professional MMA fighters and just all different sports and stuff. But you had a lot of success in that area. And we've crossed paths with a lot of people that also coach those people differently, strength and conditioning, that sort of stuff. But they don't end up getting the wide exposure that you got. You know, everyone started asking you to, to come and, and help them. What do you think it was that was unique about you uh, what skills do you feel like you had or that you had to develop to get better in your personality to keep getting access to all these people? Because we get people that, you know, we've met people and they're awesome, but they only get one shot and then they don't really get the follow-up. They don't get the referral like you've had and you've had it a lot. What do you think it was that you pulled off? Luck, serendipity, being at the right place at the right time, grinding, outgrinding everyone. You know, we have been doing the same thing for a long time. Mm. When we made the first video for, uh, for Mobility Wad, um, the iPhone did not have a video camera. I'm well, just going to let the silence. Wait. <laughs> Mind's blown, right? And uh, YouTube really wasn't a thing. And you definitely couldn't upload from the iPhone to YouTube. It just mm -hmm. was impossible. And so, um, you know, well, the first thing is that we set out to solve a problem. You know, why are we seeing the same 10 things? Why don't athletes understand? What I really think, realize I've done is that we're pivoting. I'm like, look, this is deeply an issue of social justice. This is an issue of giving people access and shifting the loci of control around their healthcare back to themselves. This is about patient independent, athlete independence, right? Athlete self-reliance, patient self-reliance. And, you know, we started flipping over some tables saying, look, you don't need a professional person to do this, you know? One, and I learned these lessons well from the masters. You know, Greg Glassman put everything he knew out for free. And it was like, no, don't go do this in your garage. I mean, look at, look at right now, I think the current revolution in strength and conditioning is the garage gym. The garage gym has become a thing. It's the new man cave, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And you'll see that people have shifted. They've gotten a lot of formal training. They're competent now. Now they've shifted into smaller micro communities seeking that, and that's, that's the garage. Mm. And so 
you know, I think that's a revolution in decentralizing who is allowed to Olympic lift, where do you get Olympic lifting shoes, who, who, where can you do this? It's, it's amortize this and, and democratize this across this gigantic platform. Like, if you, you know, people have like a workout room in their closet. It's pretty crazy, right? These rogue rigs are everywhere. So on the one hand, when we started this, we set out to not start a business. It wasn't a business. It wasn't even, a, you know, people weren't teaching courses. I mean, CrossFit were some of the first courses. Strong First was doing some courses. CrossFit was doing some courses. Now there's 500 Olympic lifting courses, et cetera, et cetera. But what we haven't done, we haven't deviated from, is we still create a bucket load of content. We still try to serve people. And I, uh, one of the things that I think that there's a twofold. One is that um, it definitely helps to have some notoriety right? And some early win and successes, but we didn't stop, you know, and if you're, if you're really asking me, I think, um, one of the things that serves me well is that I don't, um, I don't s subscribe or tell you how to train. I believe that you and your community knows how to train. Mm. So what, you know, I work in a lot, I spend a lot of time and I mean more high performance environments you can imagine. It's yeah. shocking. And, and, what I'll tell you around before I come back to that first piece is that every time I see a new piece of data, I go in there, try to serve the coaches. How do I help them solve their problems? I don't try to tell them how to bench press. Yeah. Right. And so you can, I created a model that you can drop in anywhere. So if you don't, you know, like GMV fitness is great. Those guys have great programming, right? Gymnastics. Yeah. yeah. It's just gymnastics, body flow control. Yeah. I just think that they're super clever. I don't know them. I don't have any, I've never talked to them. Right. I think their stuff is great, but it's all slow. Uh -uh. Right. If we move, it'll come back on. Oh, it's light sensors. <laughs> Do some burpees, bro. So, um, it might be, uh, over there. There it is. Nice. So, but that isn't the way I think, I don't think you can do GMB and go to the Olympics. I don't think yeah. you can go, you, you can't do those things. Yeah. It's a beautiful movement practice, right? But it's slow and controlled and rat. It, it would be great if everyone did that, we would cure cancer in America, mm -hmm. right? It would mean like a lot of things would get solved. Comma, I don't go in there and say you should probably do, do some deadlifts and hill sprints too, right? right. Like that's what's missing from your program. Yeah. I'm like, but I can drop in and say, how can I, I can improve your program because I have this model that works. But then because I get to go behind the scenes everywhere, I see all the problems that people are solving or trying to solve, and I see all everyone's dirty laundry. So imagine a decade of dirty laundry from every branch of the military, every professional sport you can see, and eventually you've been into enough high-performance environments, you start to you know, refine your thinking. Right. You know, so one is that we really do come at this with an, with an act of service, you know, that we believe that we have, like, uh, we were mentioning earlier, if I had to give us a grade right now as a community, like, why do we train? Like, what's the point? Just for us? Well, my hypothesis around high performance sport is that it allows us to treat, we treat that as a Formula One concept, that this is the most stress, the most load, the fastest pieces. And because this is when we, we talk about not just making you you know, you need to come out. What's Carl say? He's like, you need to come out unharmed at one rep or a million reps, right? Yeah. That's an old Carl Pally state. Yeah. And the idea here is that we use sports to test the robustness of our ideas. And then we've got to take those things back into the world, right? Like Formula One, you get like disc brakes, but then it ends up on your camera eventually, mm -hmm. right? Or your sport you. And, um, right. So you can have that slab of stubbies in the back. I know. I know what's up. You guys drinking the VB. The VBs, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. with you. So the idea here is, if we're, if we're really going to use sport the way it is, let's actually take what we're learning and apply it backwards. Otherwise, it's just circus. And who cares about circus, right? Mm. It's, it's entertainment. Like, let's just be entertained. Screw it. All the dysfunction, all the broken bodies, we'll just pile them up because we're gladiators <laughs> and we like to be entertained. Or we can take what we're learning and apply it backwards, but we haven't done that yet. So right now, we're still in this little echo chamber of vanity, of fitness, of my, my kung fu heart style is better than your kung fu heart style. And that's really crazy. So... If I have to give us a grade, we all get a D. And we get a D because we haven't really moved. We haven't solved childhood obesity. We haven't, you right. know, in the United States right now, when I went to high school in my age cohort, uh, the chances of me being, being diabetic was one in 4,000. And now it's one in four. Well, uh, you're going to be diabetic as a what, kid. What, what timeline is that? Years. By the time you're an adult, right. by the time you're 30. 
You'll be diabetic. So in like 20 years it shifted. We nearly got diabetic on this trip. We've only been here two weeks. Well, we actually call that the Inflammation Pro Fun Tour. It's really like how many waffles can you eat, how many good cookies. <laughs> and if you're not inflamed, you're not doing your job. We're right? trying. Yeah. We're trying our best, our best shot. So, so, you know, and if you're, a, if you're a, a black woman in this country, your chance of being diabetic are two out of three. Wow. If you're a, a Hispanic male, it's two out of three. So I'm yeah. like, this is all this eating revolution counting your macros how's that going for us it, it's bullshit we haven't we haven't actually done anything hmm. so we haven't launched a revolution we haven't because it hasn't we haven't democratized this information we haven't inoculated people early enough into the ways of that hey let's eat whole foods let's move around a little bit more it's very simple and i think you can even see what crossfit's doing right now is pivoting into trying to understand i mean sometimes it's weird to see people lift bottles of windex but um <laughs> It is getting that way. It's weird. <laughs> Got the broom. But That'll be a Dow. they need to show you that it does go and that we need to get those people moving because where otherwise we're just getting more Matt Frasery. Mm. And that's cool. I like to be Matt Frasery. Comma. You know, the most important is that we're, we're, we've got a country that's going to be bankrupt. Mm. And do you think part of the problem is uh, a lot of the guys and girls at the top actually do loads of the stuff, the basic stuff, completely wrong? Like they barely warm up. The nutrition's not great. Oh, because they're, because the contrary, they're genetic freaks? No, 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 no. They, they are some of the best athletes we know. What I, like, they are honestly, the, the professionalism of our top uh, functional athletes, our CrossFit athletes, for lack of a better word, because that's what they are, um, are some of the best athletes I know in terms of movement preparation, movement quality, skill sets, Right, the the ding on them is that maybe they can't paddle or run or throw. Mm. But those are things mm. that they, no one said they have to value. So every time the games makes you value something, then it gets good. You have to oh you have to swim now. Like people are swimming pretty yeah. well. Oh you have to run a mile. Like, you know, take take anyone at the gym or take anyone off of a, a street or at a at a college gym. And I'm like oh, great. First I need you to snatch 300. You're probably a good athlete. Oh you can't snatch 300. Oh I have 10 friends who can snatch 300. And then we're gonna go run this mile. Under, under six minutes and then we're going to swim a mile and then run another mile under six minutes like how are you doing mm. you know mm. keep up so the ding again is I don't think you can be an elite crossfitter and actually do another sport full time <laughs> right I think it's really difficult yeah. and Tia is a good example of someone who's done a good job of s- taking a slice of the sport that she's doing well and then just she's just doing that same slice of sport yeah. but you know that that's just an issue of time how do we apply sort of modern functional training for lack of a better word for this phenomenon that is how people are using crossfit principles right to modernness and then and then tweaking that so you can actually still go do a sport hmm. you know i was just uh just chatting up nick gill you know who's the strength and conditioning coach with all blacks yeah. like yesterday and his programming is ruthless it's so simple here are the core movements that we're going to try to work on and improve and then all by the way hope you can keep up on the bike and all the conditioning because he realizes that where should we be developing athleticism? Is it in the gym? No. no the that's, a, that's a terrible place to yeah. do that. And in fact, if you look at a lot of our best athletes, they didn't become best athletes in the gym. They became best athletes on the, on the field. And sometimes we confuse gym performance for athletic performance. So CrossFit is a, is a great example of potentially taking people who are mediocre athletes but who could work really hard. And then we were like, oh, you must be the best because you can work so hard in the gym. I'm like, come with me. We're going to go throw play frisbee yeah. or kickball or surf or skateboard or whatever it is you want to do. And it turns out mm, it doesn't make you a better athlete necessarily. Mm. It can improve your athleticism because it can do all the things – like improve your rate, your range of motion and coordination and, 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 and all of those things and your explosive power, comma, you're still going to need to go do a lot of sport. See rule number one, go play and learn new sports a lot. Yeah. But we lost that, that, that language in there. And by the way, splits was part of that original concept, right? You got to do the splits. Right. That was, yeah, there's actually a big disconnect between like our best athletes in the, in the gym and how well they can just move, even just running. I think yeah. if you just look at someone run, if they just don't fire in a beautiful sequence and it just looks majestic, then you just know how that's going to translate to catching a ball, throwing a ball, swinging a bat, like all that stuff, right? And yeah, they're actual, just, they're just gym sports. Warriors. Yeah. yeah and, and all movement, dancing, yeah, anything. That's right. And, and so, again, what I'll say is, hey, we told everyone we got to value this. So we valued it. And now we can say, let's move on to the next P. It's not anyone's fault. It's just a normal expression of the system. But we have to be meta or at least aware enough to understand where the holes are so that we can improve our thinking and evolve the practice. Mm. That's okay. 
evolution is part of it. I don't think anyone ever said, we nailed it, mm. you know. But how many people have a, you know, two and a half minute rant? A lot of people, mm. you know. And so I'm like, okay, that's good enough. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, go let's go do some other things yeah. versus shaving a second off your rant yeah, time. Yeah. And, and, and you know, it's free will. I mean, if that's what, get, you know, that's what's allowing you to go back into your world and saying it's you have a better com- relationship with your wife and you have self-confidence and you've, you know. I mean, he, here's an example of what we're not doing well. Um, my, my daughter's going to high school next year. We were at a, a high school family event, right, where they get all the kids together this weekend. And Julie and I were looking around, and we're like, wow, all these women look great. They're all great. And I think it's in a really screwed-up reason they look so great because they had all these weird societal pressures to be lean and skinny and under-eat right. and exercise and take care of themselves. Otherwise, we won't value as women, right? The men looked like Jabba the Hutt. <laughs> <laughs> Dissolving. Like you poured water and he's melting. <laughs> We did not look good. We were, we all were fat. We all had double chins. We were all pudgy. Like we just, we looked pasty. And I was like, wow, look at the difference between these men and yeah, these yeah. women. These women are hot. You know, they, they don't have health insurance. I mean, they have health insurance. They don't have student loan debt. They have 401k. That's so sexy, yeah. right? They drive a car that they own. I mean, that's amazing. And they're lean. And then these guys, I'm like, whoa, it's a shit show. Mm. So again, no. you know, we need to get started. And once we're started, then we can have the next conversation. You don't mm. have to move perfectly. We have time to move perfectly. But in the meantime, let's get, let's get moving. But we're not, we're not doing a good job. Yeah. So <clears throat> one of the things that popped up, hasn't popped up in Australia yet for like a whole bunch of different reasons, but it has popped up in the States of these um, hormone replacement therapy clinics. And I don't know what your personal opinion is on them. I imagine we're going to find that now. But do you think they came about because the health system was so broken on the front end of like where they started as kids and technology and food and all this stuff that it slides all the way down to, you know, you hit your 50s and your 60s and you're like, man, I just feel like rubbish. And they go, okay, we have this new solution. I guess it's a Band-Aid essentially, but it's like the biggest, most invasive, best Band-Aid you could ever buy because all of a sudden you, you get so much of your vitality back. If you didn't have all these problems on the front end, would you not need those clinics? Because in Australia, we don't really have them. I think it could be for other reasons, like obviously legality and stuff. Yeah, all that sort of stuff. But maybe Australia, the problems you guys here. don't allow trampolines and stuff that's dangerous. Like you actually, yeah, government no, actually tries to protect you. Yeah, there's no melatonin and shit. You can't do that. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. Like you guys are like sunscreen. Yeah, it kills everything. No, you should probably have a different idea. <laughs> so, um, well, he, here's what your deal is that we have new technology. And this is allegory for social media, et cetera, any, anything, right? Is mm-hmm. that we don't know how to integrate it. It's all, this is all new, really new experience. Um, I think it's a relatively very new phenomenon to be able to understand what your blood panel is and engage in something called functional medicine, which means you're not in the ranges between like RDA, right? Your recommended daily allowance. You know, that's the minimum so you don't get rickets. That's the minimum so you don't have scurvy, right? I mean, those are like disease states. That's very far away from, hey, you don't have rickets, you're okay, to... Where are you feeling good? Like, you know, you, your vitamin D has a range, and we want you at the top of those ranges, right. right? That whole notion of, you know, how do we bank capac- or bank wellness and fitness and, and use it? So you can, you, you can use that as your, as your same around your, sort of your blood paneling. The problem is now that what we have is that people are not engaged in any of the activities required to be a healthy organism. So... Um, you know, what we're doing is we're slapping a testosterone pill into people's butts or a patch. Meanwhile, their sleep is crap. They're, they're functional alcoholics. And, and let me be very clear, that alcoholism delineation is not very – you trip over that pretty quickly. Two or three drinks a night, right. you, that's yeah. functional alcoholism. I mean, you, you ha- you're considered a heavy drinker at that point, right? right? I think you're an alcoholic when your life is being messed up. Right, but shouldn't we put your fitness in there? So if you're drinking to a place, so for example, and I, I'm not throwing any shade because, and I'll explain for a second. Here in Marin, where we are, northern, we're 20 minutes north of the city. Um, we used to be the healthiest county in California, and now we're not because of adult binge drinking. And so what we're seeing is that people are buying wine. You can have access to this good wine. People are drinking a bottle of wine at night, um, and we think it's because they're so stressed out. They don't know how to self-medicate. And so again, if you're gonna untug some of this some of these kind of what seem like really easy problems are really complex problems that hey i didn't sleep well because i have netflix and my phone yeah 
I'm so now I'm drinking 17 cups of coffee and I have this five hour energy yeah. past four o'clock. I can't, and I'm stressed and I mouth breather and I sit and don't move. I don't accumulate an exercise activity. I'm smashing myself in the gym, another stressor. And then, and I'm fasting and then, you know, I need to have this glass of wine to turn off. And now you get, and then because I have wine, I don't sleep well and it just gets into this terrible loop. That's so common what you just said. Yeah. It is, so it is so common, right? Well, yeah. I need to go smash myself because that's what – look, I had wine and I got it. You know, so yeah. what we're, for us, we divide everything into central nervous system stressor or tonic, right? Is this, is this easy on the nervous system or hard on the nervous system? And I think what you're seeing is that's an expression of, hey, we have type 1 errors in our thinking. And a type 1 error is a basic mistake. So anything after that that you're – you're predicating on that thinking is always going to be an error because the basis is wrong, right? The foundation is wrong. Yeah. So what we're seeing is people trying to have a short-term solution to a very complex problem. And temporarily, yeah, your testosterone goes up and you feel good. But meanwhile, you're going to shove that into estrogen and you're not, you're going to, dis- you're going to dissolve anyway, mm. you know, because um, your sleep is suck. You, you know, you don't eat food, right? You know, it, and it is, is if we can sell stuff to people, we do, right? That's really the magic. Like yeah. it's, I mean, we were in New York a couple weeks ago for spring break, and there's a new eating regimen in New York called Pagan. Pagan? Pagan. You haven't heard of it? No. It's paleo plus vegan. Oh, my God. Oh, oh yeah. That makes perfect sense. Pagan. <laughs> then you could go Pagano, so uh, paleo plus vegan plus keto. Oh, dude. Pagano. <laughs> Ooh, that's Pagano. Step. <laughs> that is. <laughs> and what's amazing is that there was, it's a plant-based diet plus small amounts of, of meat protein. Of animal protein, and I was like, "You mean eating? Like, that's what you're fucking. Say- that's where we are now. Like we're, we're like you're eating plants and food, and like what? So, I think the confusion is we're we're treating everything like a commodity, and we're selling everything, and so people are so confused. Mm. But that Netflix thing, where it says next next play is starting in you know, three, two, you're like, oh, red button. Dude, you're dead. Mm. And I I don't think we're realizing how important these foundationals are. And what, what's interesting in the world of physio right now, um, there's a real sort of back and forth about what is physio. And Australia has is crazy. You have some crazy-ass physios right now. Hmm. And um, one is we're seeing people go to these physio mills, right? And they're not getting treated at all. They're getting, like, cracked, passive therapy, a little crappy therapy. Go, we'll see you 10 more times hmm. until your insurance runs out or whatever, right? And what we're realizing is, hey, your brain is responsible for a lot of this. You know, your pain is, is driven by a lot of f- complex factors, including h- how badly you move. But if you've ever been in strength and conditioning, you've always been talking about sleep and nutrition. I mean, we put it first in CrossFit because it was that important, right? Yeah. But because you would s- show up in the gym and suck. <laughs> so you had this immediate barometer <laughs> yeah. of how well you – were able to reduce the session cost yesterday and come in and, and slay today. And I'm like, wow, you were last today. What, what happened? You know, mm. you were the weakest. You're like, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's the 17 hamburgers and the in and out and the f- five beers and I didn't sleep last night. Is that it? You know? So we had this really tightly coupled feedback. Most people don't have that feedback. They can buffer that for a long time. And then their brains are like, oh, this is normal. So I think what's happening in, in physio, for example, is saying, hey, look, we have to look at the human being in the, its environment. And that's the most important thing, which means, are you in loving relationships? Do you feel connected to part of a community? Do you have sense of purpose and belonging, right? Do you sleep? You know, are you a stress case? Are you eating food? Or are you eating you know, sugar cereal, mm. right? And just drinking Diet Coke, you know, like it's, it's a sort of a big complicated problem. Yet that's as important as let's give you shift your low side of control back to feeling like you can protect yourself and take care of yourself like we were talking about earlier, right? right the self-reliance. But I can really see where those physios are coming from. I appreciate that they're saying that, hey, all of this other stuff matters. And I think what's happening is we are witnessing the wholesale de-evolution of the human being. Mic drop. <laughs> and wholesale. <laughs> wholesale. Like just we're just going to – the allegory of all these middle-aged guys <laughs> at my daughter's high school, that's us as a community. Like we look terrible. Some of us are looking great. Most of us are looking bad. Yeah. And um, one of our friends is a girl named – a woman named Katie Bowman. Have you run into Katie? Yeah. Um, she's brilliant. She has, an, she has a metaphor that she uses where um, if you put an orca into captivity, an orca whale, yeah. the, eventually the fin folds over. And the reason it does is – 
it always happens in captivity is two things. One is that you've changed the environment of the organism. So that orc is now spending more time at the surface than it would in any other environment, right? And that gravity is acting much higher on that fin because it's never being supported by buoyant forces. It's always above, above the water. Second, because the fin isn't being loaded, it becomes weak. That's called mechanotransduction, which is the heart and soul of the matter. You have to load yourself as a human being if you want to be a human being. If you don't want to be a human being, just you're going to have floppy fin syndrome, but that's your disc, that's your Achilles, that's yeah. your back pain, that's your brain your even, yes, yeah, yeah. the whole thing, right? So what we haven't done is, is establish what we think are benchmarks for people. Like, I don't, you know, how fit do you need to be to do your job? Not very fit, but uh, did you walk at all today? Yeah. And as we try to unravel some of these complex concepts, we got to come back to first principles. So uh, one of the elite military groups that I work with, when their guys have a hard time sleeping, the first thing they do is they give them an activity band and they make them walk 10,000 steps a day so they can get tired enough that they can actually go to sleep. I thought right. the military would be Wait, working. Wouldn't they be working hard? <laughs> no, they go train for a smash, smash themselves in the gym. It's not enough activity wow. to actually accumulate a non, enough non-exercise activity f fatigue right. to actually feel like you can go to sleep. So that's what we're doing. We're sitting at our desks, go smash myself from my high-intensity 30-minute cardio booty blaster, and I go sit, and I don't move. And then I'm not tired, and I've had s crap sleep the night before, and then it's, it's what we call a complex problem, right? right. And where the, the systems are tightly coupled, or go, you end up um, not knowing what's what, and you end up with a, a human being in a toxic environment. And mm -hmm. what you're seeing is that human beings are really good at buffering that. And then now we're like, mm, here, take some testosterone, that'll solve everything. Yeah. Why'd your testosterone show off in the first place, bro? Mm. So, you know, that's what we need to be asking ourselves. And that's, those are the, pr the principles and lessons around strength and conditioning. You've got to move to decongest. Otherwise, your Achilles is going to suck when we go run later. Mm. So let's, uh, let's put first things first. And then, by the way, until everyone knows that and we don't have a job, we're going to keep saying the same thing because we haven't reached everyone. Yeah, and people just value so much just how they look. And so if so many people are drawing the line between hormone replacement and looking really good, they're going to go for the easy win every single time. And they're not going to look at, okay, well, maybe that person looks really good because they sleep really well and they have a good relationship and they eat really good food. They just ignore all those things. And some people honestly assume that they do those things when they really don't. Right? You know, I would say 100%. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't track anything. I wear an old analog watch. But I know what time I went to sleep and how I feel when I wake up. Yeah. I, d I tried it all, right? And, I, and I, it brought consciousness and awareness. But what's nice about these trackers is at least we can begin to say, hey, let's, what do we even know? We were at an, athlete, an Olympic athlete holding camp for the Olympics and um, for a bunch of sprinters. And we're like, all right, who gets enough sleep? Everyone's like, yeah, we're Olympians. We get enough sleep. And we're like, yeah. good, show us. Not a single athlete yeah. got the recommended amount of sleep or the sleep that they were saying they got. Wow. They were lying. So if those people are just, they're, they're lying or they didn't know. <laughs> yes. Lying to themselves. Lying to themselves. Yeah. And if those are the athletes who theoretically it's really easy for them to sleep because that's their job. then what about the rest of us who actually have two children and yeah. pets that bark at raccoons? And, you know, I mean, like it's really tricky to get in there. So how can we begin to, you know, say this is what's important and you know, we're going to have to, we're going to have to untangle it. Otherwise it's going to, it's madness. Mm -hmm. We're going to get more and further away from, you know, homeostasis. And then as soon as you put a, a bunch of noise in there, hormone replacement. And let me tell you, if you've had a bunch of concussions, hormone replacement probably is a good idea. Why? Well, we, we got your sleep. We've got your exercise. We're talking about those things, but you have rattled your anterior pituitary. You don't actually make growth hormone or testosterone. That's very different, right? All of like the military guys, you know, concussion sports these are reasons to do it right the military guys have those issues yeah because, because of the military? overpressure from all the explosions wow. so and the fact yeah. that they basically shut their adrenals down uh shut their adrenals down sh shut their thyroid down the whole system but but check this out we um one of my sort of idols is a woman named stacy sims who oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, men are not small women. No, that's right. No, women, women are not small men. Women yeah. are not small men. That's right. Yeah. That's Stacy. She's the preeminent researcher around sex differences in sports science. Mm. And um, she recently had an article. You know, I have two daughters, so I'm really conscious about um, how we're treating women, the, the, the fact that most sports science is just done on men, right? Because women are too complex biologically, so we just throw their samples out, right? <laughs> awesome. That's true. 
And, um, you know, we've been under-prescribing meds to women, over-prescribing meds to women because their physiologies are different, right? right? And they're different in terms of the month. But if, as if you're a male coach and you don't know when your women are getting your period, you're actually one of the shittiest coaches in the world. Yeah. Because you fundamentally don't understand one of the driving forces of how p- women are, are, how their physiologies are working. So there's an app called Fitter Woman, F-I-T-R. I don't have any relationship with this company. But it allows athletes to track their cycles, understand that if they're in high hormone phase, they're not going to perform well. Boy, maybe we shouldn't load you maximally that day, but we'll push that day off three or four days. Or if you didn't, if you, were, you know, you're going to, your 400 meter times are going to suck. That's nice to know. And that would be the same way we'd want to track sleep on our athletes or understand these basic principles. But in women, one of the real things that Stacey's working on is something called relative energy deficiency syndrome. And this really ties into what you were talking about, about aesthetics. Like we, man, if you don't have a six pack, if you do not shred and sculpt with cannonball delts, like you're a failure, right? Cannonball delts. Cannonball delts. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> and um, you say kettlebell delts. I like that now. That's more <laughs> modern. So one of the problems is that that means potentially people are eating really close to the line of not getting enough calories. Yeah. Right? That's energy deficiency syndrome. So if you add enough stress to the organism, the organism responds in kind. And one of the ways for women is we see something we used to call the athletic triad, and which was loss of period, um, bone mineral density, right? There are a couple other things going on, right? Mm. And, um, you know, when we see uh, like bony fractures in women, like stress fractures, that's a red flag. That things physiologically are not going yeah. on, especially when athletes are loaded. But it turns out that the period is a great example. If you stop getting your period as a woman athlete, you need to go, what the hell is going on? You have inter- you're no longer a human being. You're such a stressed animal that the human being is like saying, nope, you can't even be a human anymore. We're going to shut down your reproductive system because you're such a stressed person. So what we need to ask ourselves is, whoa, whoa what's the mechanism for that? And this relative energy deficiency is that we're seeing that girls are training, 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 don't eat enough crash their thyroid function maybe forever. That's how sensitive the system is. So if we're talking about aesthetics and I'm like, you got to be shredded and look like Lauren Fisher and all these jacked women on the, on the Insta and I under eat and smash myself and don't sleep. We have, we're creating the problem. So your original question, are we creating problems? We are creating a bunch of narcissistic dysfunction disorders Mm -hmm. on top of movement dysfunction disorders, right? Yeah. I know you tore your labrum in your shoulder, but you haven't been able to put your head over your arms over your head ever in your life. And you thought you'd just do muscle ups, Mm. you know, a dynamic kipping motion on there. So difficult to weasel that out. How are we going to solve that? A little bit at a time. Mm. And, and we're not going to catch everyone. And what we have started to find and what we're starting to uncover is... When I'm you, being as honest. This, this is the most honest. I don't know if you caught me on an honest day, <laughs> but I'm just giving the hell today. Hey, this is how we do it. Dude, this is how we I do don't it. know if we're facing each no, other. No, we want the honesty. This is, uh, this is as harsh as I've ever been in a podcast. <laughs> Usually I'm like, syrup we can coffee. do this. No, this is black coffee. <laughs> like my soul today, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I just here. Well, let me finish this idea. Yeah. Yeah. If you have a daughter, don't put her on birth control because you won't be able to tell if she's overtrained. Does that make sense? Mm. That's crucial. If you're a parent and you just automatically put your daughter on birth control to try to regulate her hormones or have her feel a little better, <coughs> then when she stops getting her period because she's overtrained, you won't know and you're causing a problem. Mm. So it's a good indicator. That's a brilliant indicator. Yeah. It's interesting because that just on that the. A lot of doctors, like my girlfriend, her doctor has tried to give it to her so many times, but it's for her skin. And I'm just kind of like, well, why are you giving her hormone? Put the altering? donut down. Yeah. Let's go get some sun. Mm. Yeah. Right? Like it's just a, it's a weird prescription for a certain problem. You know, it's like, oh, the skin's breaking out. But you know what? Why don't we just control this thing with this pill? And I was like, whoa. Seems like a hammer. Yeah. I was like, that's not, that's not a good idea. Uh, I don't know why you would do that, but... She's smart enough to know that obviously that's, that would mess her up. But you a lot guys, of women go You guys for are that. on the bottom of the earth just hanging down. <laughs> so well, there's a lot of things going on. <laughs> just hanging. <laughs> We're just hanging, hanging on. upside down. I know that, that uh, you know, some original map makers from the UK and they just, you know, made the Europe as the center of the world without Mercator production and you guys got screwed. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's every once in a while. <laughs> it's a cylinder. We, f- <laughs> we can m- meet in the middle. Off. If you flip the world upside down, right, all of a sudden you're like, oh, this makes sense. Yeah. yeah. It does make sense. <laughs> um, so we do have a final four questions, but just before we dive into that, I think that what we've started to uncover with a lot of these problems is a lot of it is coming back to some little t, as psychologists like to call it, little t trauma, which happens very early on. And people are now using this vehicle, which is fitness and Instagram and vanity and stuff to kind of 
band-aid over and feel good about these problems that were created very early on in their life and so thirsty yeah the conversations we have with our clients start to become i wouldn't say it's a mental health issue necessarily but it is small things that happen very early on that they are now finding that fitness is becoming a very easy gateway or very easy kind of band-aid to those problems that they haven't really healed within themselves yeah exercise anorexia you know, I need to work harder. I can feel, you know, I, the muscles. <clears throat> that's right. More shredded. Yeah, and it, you know, it's it can be high school again. But I think I think you're absolutely right. What's interesting though is that <clears throat> the gym gives us a safe place. If you get injured in the gym, something is going horribly wrong. Yeah, it really is. I agree. Yeah. Because it's the safest environment in the entire ecosystem. Why? Because it's so controlled. There's not dynamic sport movements. There's not, you know, you're not twisting and extending and throwing and being no tackled. Rain, There's no, no wind. Yeah. None of it. Right? We can f- control your food and your warm up and your cool down and your recovery and, and, and comma, I can have a place where I can feel vulnerable. Right. And so I think that's what's really gotten confusing about the Internet and, you know, the selfie nation and, you know, girls showing their butts, drinking coffee. You know, um, there's a the comedian Chris D'Elia, um He's hilarious. He is hilarious. And he roasted me a few years ago. That's how and, uh, we became <laughs> friends and like <laughs> roasted. Fuck yeah. <laughs> and, what did uh, you roast you on? What video was uh, it? It's a picture. Okay, I, we put an Easter egg in a book, and he smoked me oh, so yeah. good. And then Joe Rogan retweeted it, and then it's nice. like, "Thanks, guys." Yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but he has this thing if if where he says like, "Look, look, if you are taking pictures of your booty and your and you, you know and you're that's hooking," he's like, "You're hooking." Mm-hmm. It's a new form of of selling yourself, and and clearly there's a variability in this. But he's like, you need to unfollow that because as long as we keep valuing that, that's what we're going to get more of. And we're telling people to value that. Like, I want to see women kicking ass. And I love that. But I don't, if you show your booty on my Instagram, boom, you're gone. And, and part of that is I'm trying to train myself. This is, I can't, you know, I mean, like I'm a, you know, reptile ape too, you know? Yeah. And um, I think that's a symptom of what you're talking about is that fitness becomes another addiction, another, another way that we haven't resolved Mm. and really taken this in terms of self-actualization. Instead, we've, we've created a a narcissistic dependent, really dysfunctional culture where my entire self being and worth is predicated on how do I look and how well did I do in the gym? That's Mm. really deeply flawed. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you, and in fact, dude, this is the dark podcast, but uh, (laughs) (laughs) this is, you're on it. I mean, I think we we're going to have to have this honest conversation about that. So for example, at our, our gym, men can't take their shirts off. We have a shirt on policy at the gym. And uh, sorry, just I don't want you sweating on my barbells, right? Mm. If girls want to take their shirts off, they they can, but they don't, mm. right? Because we athletes usually train their shirts on, and um, I think what we what we have to do is say what do we, what is it we value and how do we value it? And that's a little bit at a time. And you set that culture in your gym very early, and if and if we're to, I think the testosterone pellet is the same thing as the exercise addiction, right? We're just substituting that that control and like counting macros and being obsessive about food. And uh, my favorite current nutrition is, um, is the optimized nutrition. Um, I can't believe I'm blanking on, on her name. It's eat 800 grams of vegetables and fruits a day. Have you seen this? No. Um, we it's, haven't been following it. That's for sure on this trip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, but you know, I, I just think when we come back to first principles, um, we'll we'll get back to the notion that like it's really simple and you know the gym is the place where you can be in a tribe and a community maybe the only time you know at the end of every cl- we make everyone shake hands before cl- every class because this is maybe the only time where you're giving people an excuse to belong to each other doesn't matter what race you are doesn't matter what your political beliefs are it matters a little bit but less <laughs> and then uh you know u- ult- we're in san francisco and then ultimately um at the end we make everyone has to make eye contact and say good job to each other yeah. because that's the only conditional positive regard they'll get their whole day. Yeah. It happens yeah. in our gym. Hey, good job. Yeah. You know, you cheated on your double unders, <laughs> but good, good job. Good job. Eva. I'm in the warm up. Eva, <laughs> Eva Claire Sinkowski. That's uh, Eva, Eva EC Sinkowski. That's her 800 right. grams. Sorry about that. Yeah. But, it, but to your point, um, you know, the, the difference between poison and antidote is dose, right? Yeah. And I think yeah. we're, we're poisoning ourselves again. It's pretty fun. It's fun poison. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I, you know, there's a way to go. That's but I also, go. I, I, also, I also like to play a lot of sports. Yeah. 
Yeah. So final four questions. Did they re- did these questions reach you? Did you get a chance? Oh, yeah, to look yeah. At them? yeah. Awesome. So my wife and I even talked about them last night. Oh, fantastic. So first question. If you had an opportunity, you have a uh, you have lots of opportunities to interview amazing people on your podcast. But maybe there's someone out there that you're chasing or that would be a dream interview. Uh, who would you choose and why? Well, let me say the obnoxious thing. Arnold. <laughs> no, um, we have seen. I think the internet podcast has given us access to people that we never had before. And it's really incredible that you can download and listen. Um, we listened to Jeff Daniels on Alec Baldwin's podcast recently, just talking about his early hustle and grind as an actor and how he thought of himself. Like, whoa, you can just, you can yeah. do that over and over again. Like Joe Rogan is the Oprah of, of men's fitness. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's brought in and so many ideas and you can really have these in-depth conversations. And so it has changed a little bit. But I'll tell you is that my current, one of my current writing heroes and thinking heroes is Yuval Harari. Yeah. And if you guys haven't read Sapiens or Homo Deus, um, and the reason is because I think underlying a lot of the conversations we're having today is that we're lacking context. And what we don't ever, you know, I just finished this book by uh, Stephen Pressfield, which was, he wrote Gates of Fire, right? Yeah. Um, he wrote uh, War, War of, of Art. Art. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And uh, it's about uh, Alexander the Great's early Afghan campaign, 300 B.C. Wow. You're like, oh, the Afghans repelled the Macedonians in 300 B.C. <laughs> I wish we'd remembered that <laughs> because, you know, if their logistics and sophistication was that great 300 BC to be able to move armies across continents and get people paid, like we've been sophisticated for a long time. It's just hard to remember all of that context. That's, I think that's really tricky. And Yuval has done a wonderful job of trying to give historical context as a generalist. He, you know, um, he's so versed in sort of general history that he can see, understand the principles that are really impacting us today. And I think that's the problem with sort of snapshot of fitness is that you don't get all this context. You know, this is a a game. There's a wonderful book that I love called Finite and Infinite Games. And we are treating fitness and wellness like a game you can win that has clear start and stop. And we know all the rules. That is not the case we're playing an infinite game, which is the only way to win an infinite game is to keep playing and try to play beautifully, right? Mm -hmm. And when you switch that in your mind, you don't win business. You can't. You can do is keep playing better business, right? Because you can't tell what's coming. You can't tell what injuries you're going to have, especially if you play sports or the trauma in your life or if your mom gets cancer. I mean, like, you just don't know what's going on. So I think when we have context... And we can do a better job of understanding where this is in, in evolution and process. We will have better outcomes. And you, no one is doing better than Yuval. I'm just, I'm such a fan. Yeah. We almost I, want, I want to write and talk about wellness and health the way Yuval Harari talks about humans. Right. That's uh, it's awesome. It's a great answer. We almost had the opportunity to, I think, see him in person because a friend of ours that's a client at the gym does tours for intellectuals. So he brings out like Neil deGrasse Tyson and... I uh, had like Roxanne Gay recently, like head of one of the feminist movements, stuff like that. And he almost got Yuval, but I think because he's so popular right now that his price tag is like absurd, <laughs> like so absurd. And the, I don't know if you listened to it or did you read it? Oh, uh, read it. Okay. So if you listen to it, whoever talks about it, if that was Yuval, he would have paid that money. But apparently Yuval doesn't speak as well as he writes. <laughs> so unfortunately him on a stage, us being asked questions might not be as entertaining as his books. Yeah, well, that's true. It's, yeah. it's, it's tricky. He just needs another 10,000 reps. He'll get there. Yeah. yeah. But he's got a book. He's got a new book. Um, 21, yeah. 21 lessons. lessons for the 21st century. Yeah. yeah. I'm excited for yeah. that. I don't know what he's going to write next. Um, did you guys know, have you read David Epstein's book? You know, he wrote the, the sports, sports gene. gene. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, Dave and I became friends a few years ago and uh, Dave's new book is, is about being a, um, a generalist and not a specialist. And you've all... Um, Specializations for insects. Right? That's, that's right. Thing? That's yeah. right. And um, that's uh, Robert A. Heinlein, right? Right. And um, the, I think that um, you've all ended up writing his books because no one in his faculty wanted to teach a general history course. They're all specialized. Right. So he becomes this uber generalist... <laughs> you know, and finds his niche because he's he's competent at everything. Boy, that sounds like fitness, doesn't it? Yeah. You know what I mean? You, you know what I mean? You don't know how to feel for a run or deadlift a little bit or, right? Interesting. Second question. What is something currently that you do each day that you feel like, you try and do it most days, but you feel like is essential to the success of that day? Sleep. 
we protect our sleep. Juliet will say the same thing. Mm. We're just zealous about sleep because what we found is that uh, that's the thing that I can't give up. Okay. And that um, you know, recently, uh, like two weeks ago, I was in L.A., taught a course, took a red eye to go speak to the military, slept three hours, then up at three in the morning. Sounds you, like you, you know, just yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just get caught, right? Yeah. yeah. And then it it took me ten days to dig out from that. Wow. I could not put my foot on the accelerator on the the workouts. You know, mm. me to get on the bike and or lift. I'm like, wow, I'm dead. What uh, dead inside? Can you walk us through your routine a little bit. Uh, it's boring. It, okay. it really is just like we try to eat. I have two kids. You know, I have a savage woman. Ask Julia about her routine. She, in fact, I'm going to tee you up because you're going to be my <laughs> CEO wife who's mm. brilliant. Um, but she's going to throw a fit because everyone talks about men routines and there's never kids or logistics. Yeah. Talk about what women, elite women mothers do. Mm. That's that's a real proper question. You're like lighting candles and she's doing diapers and shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, my coffee has the perfect <laughs> ratio of fat. It's like boiling she, the kettle. Yeah, perfect that's right. Degrees. She's like, What's, what are you doing? <laughs> she's already answered 70 emails and made three lunches. And, you know, so, yeah. um, you know, we we, uh, we do try to walk in the morning. That's when we can. I'd say that that's another piece, just mm. a little bit of movement first thing. Yeah. You know, I really like that. I, I like had a, um, I had a mate's dog for a couple of days or a few days and first thing you do with dogs is walk them and so I got I was being forced straight out of bed to, to walk yeah. the dog around the block and it was so effective at just setting up my day that I've just kept it in my routine you mean drinking 17 cups of coffee and looking at internet isn't the right way to get <laughs> I tried it for check, many years check this check <laughs> this out there's this thing in yoga called sun salutation I wonder what that was all about Mm. Mm. Yeah, here's a 10-minute yoga flow to get your body prepped for the day. It's almost like someone had thought critically about that <laughs> a long fucking time ago. <laughs> yeah. And finally, you know, we're, we're, just, we're just connecting the dots. It's just difficult because it's not part of our training. Mm. Imagine if to graduate physio school, you had to understand the basics of sports nutrition. You had to have, be able to do Pilates and, and jump into a yoga class, right? Well, imagine if you couldn't, you couldn't graduate high school unless you could Olympic lift and swing a kettlebell and run a mile under eight minutes. I mean... There, we can do those things with just its initial will, and we're yeah. not, and we haven't said it's important to us as a culture. Yeah, way down on the values chain, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Way down. Um, third question is: What is something recently you changed your mind on that for a while was a strong held belief? I think I'm a lot more of a realist around um, first things first, and if we're gonna untang, you know, I would love it if everyone had a a physical practice, but right now I'm like, dude, you need to sleep and, and drink some water and walk, yeah. and then we can have the next conversation. John Berardi is one of my nutrition heroes, Precision Nutrition, and mm. his the magic of John's stuff is it's all about behavior change, and um, he, had a, he had a client who was like 400 pounds, and the guy's like, okay, what am I going to do? And John's like, okay, are you ready? Here's two, I'm going to give you two goals this week. You have to get a dog. And then the guy's like, okay, I got a dog. And he's like, great, how's it going? And he's like, well, I have to walk a lot. And he's like, good job. Yeah. <laughs> nice. And then he's like, okay, now this week you're going to have a glass of water a day. And the guy's like, what? And that worked already. Yeah. He's losing weight and drinking mm -hmm. water wow. and, like, mm -hmm. behavior changed, right? Mm -hmm. He's like, when do I start measuring my chicken breast? And he's <laughs> like, mm, yeah. not yet, bro. Yeah. So I think for us, we have, we're in a society where people are a proxy of the system. They don't know how their bodies work. And then when something breaks, they just go on a, a mad chase for it. And, you know, if, if we could say you've really got to protect your sleep and got to move a little bit more during the day, right, hit that 10,000 steps, Try to get seven to eight hours of sleep as a minimum, and then we can have the next conversation. You know, like I think you know, one of the magics uh, if you could work on the ground while you're sitting on the ground. Like I've been sitting cross-legged a ton and uncross-legged, but if you could uh, get up and down off the ground a lot today, a lot of other problems around your back and hips would just get sorted out, mm -hmm. right? Because this is such a long experience. So work on the ground, right? Move as much as you can during the day. Drink some water, sleep. I just have become so reasonable. I'm like, you should deadlift 2.7, 2. 2 point <laughs> times your body weight and let or be a complete man. Comma, you should probably just walk and, you know, <laughs> and, talk, and, and talk about your feelings. Yeah. <laughs> right? Answer emails when, you know, when you're squatting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you just spend a bit of time on the ground, you just realize how much you move around. I think we, mm. we made sitting so awesome because you can just sit still and be so productive for eight hours straight like a coffin. The only thing that moves are your fingers and you get so much work done that when we move to the ground, which is way better for us, we're like, we don't feel as productive because we're moving around more. But really, we want to be healthier. I mean, is that work more important than your health? Yeah, and there's some people who, uh, Philip Beach wrote a great book called Muscles and Meridians. And he thinks that sitting on the ground, like we're a ground-based animal. 
Mm. Like that's what we do. We build fires, we eat, we sit, we sleep on the ground. And it's interesting. If you look at cultures that toil on the ground, sleep on the ground, the fall risk in their elderly drops to zero. They don't, old people don't fall down. Mm. Um, hip disease starts to drop to zero. Lumbar disease starts to drop to zero. There's something about getting up and down off the ground that's fundamental to being a human being. Yeah. Oh, Turkish got it. Oh, I got it. Mm. Burpees. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, I think, I think we, we, we're overcomplicating things. You know, the chair is a modern invention, but, you know, we've been around for two and a half million years. Yeah. Right. I wonder if they had a stone, if they ever sat on the stones. You bet they, they did. Just... They did, but they also sat on the ground a yeah. lot. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this uh, last summer we went on the Grand Canyon, a 16-day trip. We're, we're f- former dirtbag river guides, and um, it's a big self-support trip. And we just, you know, sleeping on the ground six days, days in a row. And uh, first thing you have to do is get into a squat to get up. And I was like, oh. You know, mm. I didn't, I didn't, tr- I tried to put shoes on for the long hikes I did, but I didn't wear shoes for like 16 days mm. and then slept on the ground. And the changes in my own body in 16 days were pretty profound. Really? Yeah. So from, is it from like getting up and down or is it, I'm guessing that's easy for you. It's, it's just literally sleeping without a pillow and a mattress. Some of that, some of it's just being on the ground all the time, even more than I'm on the ground, you know, just kneeling and packing my stuff up first thing in the morning. I was just like you went for a walk while well, I just did a lot of ground based work, mm. you know, and then just, if you don't wear shoes, there's always a couple chunks of, sometimes like I'm not wearing shoes. I'd wear shoes a little bit. It's the rain and shit, but, um, <laughs> Um, I'll go, I'll try to go days without wearing shoes and watch your stride. Your stride rate will increase, how you strike the ground changes, your feet. The whole thing is different. Mm. And I think it's, it's one of those things we don't realize sort of how we're wrapping ourselves in bubble tape and then, you know, stabbing ourselves with needles, trying Mm. to get healthier again. Yeah. And posting on Instagram. Needles. Um, Literally needles. With a discount code. (laughs) Uh, So. Only for CBD (laughs) nail polish. (laughs) (laughs) And CBD is in everything apparently. Yeah. Over here. It's the new avocado toast. Yeah. Hey, that's good. That's good, man. Um, so final question. Is there a book recommendation or something you're reading at the moment? I know we just mentioned uh, your Val stuff, but anything outside of that that you'd recommend for people? Um, you know, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think there are some, uh, the most important book that I ever read was Dune. You've heard me say that before probably, but Dune, uh, Dune, Dune. by Frank Harbert. Mm. You know, you're shaking your head. You've never read Dune? No. No. What are you from, Australia? Yeah. Hasn't reached it yet. <laughs> wow. What are you from, the Southern Hemisphere? <laughs> like, the strange. bottom of the earth? <laughs> yeah, it's so strange. <laughs> it's desert planet. It's basically it's, it's the story the of your people. I know. Yeah. Um, I love sci-fi. I lo- I'm a, just a sci-fi. I read, like, my, my, my wife will read about a dysfunctional family and incest and heartbreak, and, 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 and that's her jam, yeah. right? And then I read sci-fi or, like, technical books about the body. <laughs> and that, I seem to be right there. Um, uh I just finished a book by Franz Bosch. Um, it's called uh, Coordination and Strength Training, and uh, it's only been recently translated, and um, he's Dutch, I think, and it's probably one of the most important books I've read in the last five years around wow. movement and thinking about this movement systems and why we're training. Wow. What was it called again? Uh, so I think it's co- Strength Training, Coordination, or Coordination and Strength Training by okay. Franz Bosch. Okay, awesome. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, you've got to read some sci-fi. Yeah. We actually talk about what's going on in the world. Yeah, that's what we've heard. I love sci-fi movies. My favorite genre. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love them. It's like that. they're so twisted. You it's know? like that, but your brain. It yeah. has to work a little bit. Yeah, you have to like, not just sit there. Can't just veg. Yeah. Um, so you are writing a book or you've just finished writing a new book that's coming out soon? We uh, uh, know that, yes, we have, we're always <laughs> in process. Um, I think uh, what we're working on right now is uh, the new website will come out in September or this September, and we will be able to serve people more effectively. New user experience, taking what we've ta- learned in the last 10 years and really distilled it down to you know, key principles. Our site right now is a little bit like the Library of Alexandria, but you know, that's, what it, that's what it looked like in 2012. And mm. we never set out to make 5,000 videos. Mm. That was an accident. You know, and uh, <laughs> you had know, a lot of times. So. Well, and you know, you're suddenly like, well, where do we put all these scrolls? Yeah, and um, kind of jam scrolls into the corner, and you know, and, and uh, so we always have access to the old site, but we just do so much more, and we really want to give people um, uh, better tools. Nice. Well, you know, I've always resisted the need for recipes, but people really do need recipes. Right. You know, I'm like, here are the principles. You know, yeah. salt, acid, yeah. you know, fat, heat, you know, yeah. and then people are like, wait, 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 what's fat? And yeah. we go, okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> scoop this into this. So that's, that's what we need to do. Nice. MobilityWad.com. MobilityWad.com. 
WOD.com. We're the first WOD anything. Hmm. So if you've ever seen Sobriety WOD or Fitness WOD or Physio WOD or Wattify. Sugar WOD or Wattify, they're all copiers. <laughs> Yeah, they owe us commission. <laughs> Kelly, it's an absolute pleasure having hey, you on. Hey, you guys. On. Thank you so pleasure. much. Thank you so Thank much you. for coming by. Nice.